All right, Souls to Save number four. This is our fourth and final week of this series. I hope you've enjoyed it so far. This series has been an interesting one for me. It's very impactful in my life in just weird, sneaky ways. <laughs> anyway, I was finding the sneakiness of this one. It creeps up on you. Uh, and today's message is really no different. This message is sort of far from tangible. Uh, as I was preparing it, I was struggling to really bring it down to earth because it just felt so like every one of you is going to walk out with a different application piece today and compare notes with somebody else and be like, did you even listen to the same sermon as I did? Because I felt like it was very all over the place. But it's also, I'm a little concerned that this message will be taken out of context and used as a weapon. <laughs> I want you to know right up front, a sort of disclaimer, I do not intend it to be that way. We're talking about truth today. Truth can be used as a weapon or it can be used to heal. And I don't want today to be taken out of context. So I'm going to try to bring all of this down to earth for you. I, I made some lists and I picked out some application pieces and, and I'm going to present a balanced truth today, but I'm aware of what could happen. Okay. And I just want to warn you going into this, we've spent the first month of this year focusing on us as a church, right? How to have unity within ourselves, but not just unity for unity's sake, right? It's because we have a purpose. We have a job to accomplish, and we will never accomplish that job without unity. It's not just a country club mentality where we should all be friends and sing kumbaya just for fun. It's for a purpose. We've got a job to do, and we cannot accomplish that job without unity. I believe that this year, God is going to show us exactly how he's going to use our, our vibrancy our passion, our selflessness to change the world with the message of the gospel. We have to get ourselves ready. Next week, we're going to start a brand new series that I'm pretty excited about, but one crucial component of unity that we haven't touched on much yet is truth, the role of truth in the church. So today we're going to be reading in Ephesians 4, verse 11. We'll start in verse 11. Now, these are the gifts Christ gave to the church, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and teachers. We've talked about that a few times throughout this series, right? Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. It's not their job to do all of the work, remember. It's their job to equip the people to do the work. This will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son, that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. Then we will no longer be like immature children. We will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies. So clever, they sound like the truth. Instead, we will speak the truth in love growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly. As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts to grow. So the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. Now, I usually read New Testament scriptures in other versions as well. I don't know if it's just because I was a church kid, Growing up, and I've heard all this stuff many, many times before, but I sort of sometimes have to jog myself out of what I, I know, what I have memorized in my head about these passages, the, the dozens of preaching I might have already heard on this passage, right? I, I want to think about it in a different way. And so I often will read different Bible translations of the same passage. Now, this one sort of hit me. Verse 14 says, Then we will no longer be immature like children. But the message puts it in a little bit of a different way. The message says, no prolonged infancies among us, please. No prolonged infancies among us, please. You know, infancy and immaturity have their place, right? We expect babies to act like babies. They can't ask for what they want yet, so they cry. That's normal. We expect toddlers to act like toddlers, but 
you, you definitely don't want a mature 20-year-old coming out of the womb, right? That would, that would be weird. We, we expect infancy and immaturity in certain stages, but we also don't want the opposite. Most of us have experienced a 20-year-old baby, too. And it's also not a pretty sight. <laughs> no fun to be around a spoiled, rotten brat, right? And a 20-year-old body. That It's no fun to be around prolonged infancy. We can also make allowances for baby Christians, right? People who have just come to Jesus, who are experiencing all this for the first time, who are still learning what it means to have a real and thriving relationship with Jesus. We, we can make allowances for that. We can lovingly guide them through it, but that's not what this is talking about. Prolonged infancy. Prolonged infancy. So what can keep us in a state of prolonged infancy? What can keep us from becoming the mature Christians God called us to be? There's a few, well, there's probably many things that can keep us from this, but there's two things I want to focus on today in particular, and the first one is fear. Fear can keep us in a state of prolonged infancy infancy for way too long. And if we want to walk together in unity and accomplish the job we were put here to accomplish, we've got to grow up and we've got to get past our fear. And to kids, fear can be a very real and very debilitating thing, right? They'll experience fear as a kid. Fear of the dark is a big one when you're a kid, right? As adults, we know that our eyes will adjust to the darkness eventually, right? There's a period of seeing nothing, right? But then there, there's a period where you can sort of see your way in the dark, and we can get past that as adults because we know that next period is coming. We can get through it. We also know that we've locked the front door and the back door and where the gun is, and I happen to own pit bulls, so not worried about the dark, right? Not worried, as an adult, we know these things. As a, as a kid, though, they feel helpless and vulnerable in a big, crazy world that they can't possibly understand, and now it's dark, too. The one thing they could control, they could see that everything was fine. Now that's been taken from them, too. We often put ourselves in these places, spiritually speaking, we don't have to live in the dark, and we don't have to live in fear anymore, though. I've actually created this sort of zero-tolerance policy on fear in my life over the past few years. I don't allow myself to be changed or moved by fear anymore. It's not that I don't feel it. I feel it. But I grew up in fear. I was so shy, socially anxious. I, felt, I called it my cage. I felt like I was in this box cage of fear I couldn't get out of, and I hated every second of it. Couldn't be myself. I couldn't do the things I wanted to do. I was just locked in fear, and I am not going back there. <laughs> not doing it. So zero tolerance policy. In fact, now I sort of see fear as like a trigger that I have to do the thing that I'm scared to do. I have to confront that thing. I have to step out in faith here. I have to flex the new gift muscle that God has given me. I have to do the thing that I'm scared of doing. And if I allow myself to be controlled by that fear for even an extra second, it's got me. No fear. Somebody described me as our fearless leader lately, and I was like, well, that's not, that's not me. <laughs> but it's not that I don't feel the fear. I don't allow it to control me. I don't allow it to affect me anymore. In fact, the, the second I start feeling it, I take a deep breath, I square my shoulders, I say, Holy Spirit, help me, and I go for it, <laughs> right? That's the way I have to conquer fear. We have to stop giving in to the fear. And there may be a time when your eyes have to adjust to the dark, but you'll get through to the other side. It's funny. Not really funny, actually, but... Coincidental, a couple of weeks ago, I felt like I was in a really dark place emotionally, mentally, spiritually, maybe. It was a week long of just dealing with some stuff and forgiving some stuff and God just crushing me and making new wine or whatever he was doing. It just felt like this dark place. And 
I felt like I, I was sort of drowning in it. But even through that time, even though I felt like I was drowning, there was always also this still small voice that said, you're going to make it. You're going to be okay. And not only that, but you're going to be stronger for this. So just hold on. <laughs> the whole time, and believe me, there was a lot of other thoughts in there, and that was not the strongest one. <laughs> it was way down deep, somewhere quiet. But it was there. I was seeing in the dark. <laughs> I was seeing in the dark. It's not like God came in and flipped on the light switch and fixed everything. He didn't. But I could see through the dark. It was shadows maybe, and it was limited sight, but I could see. I've developed that ability now through obedience over time, through applying truth over and over again over time. And maybe these two things that I have on my list today that keep us in prolonged infancy should really be one because the way to overcome fear in all its forms is radical truth. Applying the truth that doesn't feel like truth at the time to your reality that does feel very real. And, and this is where we started the series, right? Confronting the seemingly contradictory statements of Christianity. <laughs> we, we don't have to deny reality. We just have to apply the truth to it. Right? I, I'm scared, but I am strong. Right? I, I'm hurting, but I am more than a conqueror. I'm, I'm trembling, but I am brave. Everything inside me aches right now, but I trust you. I trust you. They seem like contradictions, but it's really just confronting the reality with the truth. It's faith. Faith. Most of us think we have to deny reality in order to have faith, but it's not that. It's acknowledging the reality that you're in and applying truth to it. This is why we liberally hand out the 40 I am's. If you don't know what I'm talking about, they're in the sermon notes on the app, and they're back at the I'm in table as well. I, I printed a whole bunch for this weekend. But if you're struggling with seeing who you really are beyond the fear, the insecurity and the doubts and the shame, and whatever, speak the word over yourself. <laughs> speak the word over yourself. This is how I got out of my cage of fear. As a kid, somebody told me this. This is the beauty of growing up in the church. You catch on to things that change your life from a young age, really. And I, I don't remember who preached it or how it came to me or whatever, but somebody told me along the line that you can change who you are by applying the word to yourself. Amen. You don't have to be the person you were born to be in fear and shame and sin and selfishness. You can be who God has called you to be. And so I started gathering scriptures as a kid. I wish I still had this notebook. But I, I wrote down things that meant a lot to me. I would find, I'd look in the back of my Bible and find boldness verses and bravery verses and courage verses, and I would start writing them. And every morning I would get up, and even though I felt scared of everything, I would say, the wicked flee, though no one pursues them, but the godly are as bold as lions. Right? I would say, be strong and courageous. Do not fear, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go say these things over myself, and I felt stronger, she said in faith. <laughs> right? And over time, the word applied to my reality, the truth applied to my reality, made me into the person I am today. I would never have done this. Stood on a stage and preached 20 years ago. I would have been terrified if you had even suggested it. But over time, I became the person God has called me to be through the power of the word. The word is actually not your only tool for applying truth, by the way. God gives us many tools for applying truth, like worship, for example. Worship is proclaiming who God is to remind yourself of the truth that God is so much bigger than anything you could possibly have to go through on this earth. He's so much bigger. That's the truth. That's what worship reminds you of. Praise is about celebrating the truth of who God is and what he has done to remind yourself that things aren't as bad as they seem. That he's got a plan for you. That is praise. And the truth that we can rejoice even through the storm, even through the darkness, because our God is able. That is praise. 
Thanksgiving is about reminding yourself of the truth that God has done so much for you in the past. Why wouldn't he do it again? Thanksgiving. It's all applying truth and proclaiming truth. And it's the antidote to fear. Keep a journal. Write notes. Post them all around your house. Whatever you have to do to remind yourself of the truth and its victory over fear. Fear will keep us locked in infancy. It will keep us stuck in immaturity. Overcoming it leads to maturity in Jesus Christ. The, the other thing that has really helped me, God has given us as the church, and this passage proves that he's given us apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers to equip us, to grow us, to sometimes lovingly say, grow up, dude, right? To pull us up and to grow us and, and submitting myself to those gifts over the years and learning and growing and changing and coming in to church, not just saying, oh, I know all this, right? I'm going to walk out, come in, come out, not learn anything, not connect with anybody, but really coming in with an open heart. Yeah. Notebook out, Bible out, ready to scribble notes as they come, right? Coming in, asking God, what do you have for me yeah. today? Yeah. What do I need to learn today? How do I need to grow today? Applying truth, confronting myself with truth that I wouldn't otherwise have. Amen. Choosing to actually keep my eyes and ears open to myself. It's hard to do sometimes, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. But the Bible also says, speak the truth in love, and it starts with ourselves. Apply truth to your life. Lovingly. Uh, confront yourself with truth. I'm not saying judge every single thought and motive, right? That's not helpful. It creates guilt and shame in our own thought process. It's not helpful. Don't, you don't have to judge every emotion, but examine them. Understand them. Probe them for what's underneath and submit them to Jesus. Truth is the antidote to fear. The second thing that can keep us in a state of prolonged infancy is denial, deception, lying. I've come to believe now that truth is actually incredibly important to the gospel, incredibly important to the gospel and to us as a church. There is no gospel without it, actually. There's no gospel without it. I, I don't know if I, I used to just think that it was just about Jesus and what he's done for us. And I sort of took for granted that everybody knew that they were sinners. But we don't, do we? Some of us refuse to acknowledge, actually, our, our shortcomings and our faults and our failures and the sin and the selfishness growing within us. We make all kinds of excuses for it. We think we're totally justified in it. And so how could we possibly come to know a Savior if we don't believe we need saved? We have to confront ourselves with the truth that we need him or we will never find him. We need it to accept that we are sinful. And sure, it's a painful reality. Absolutely. I told you all last week about my revelation that I suck. It shouldn't have been a revelation, but it was. I had to come to this understanding that all the good things about me are Jesus. Nothing about me is worth anything without him. I'm a sinner. I'm selfish. I'm uh, no good without him. Why do I even try without him? I shouldn't. I shouldn't be. He is so, so good and graceful and loves me anyway. That is the truth. I can't come to him and his love without understanding that I suck. <laughs> The more we try to get to God on our own, the more we'll try to be God. And that's a dangerous road to take, Satan can tell you. The more we try to get to God on our own, the more we try to be him. Truth is not only important to apply to ourselves, but it's important to apply to us as a church, as a body of believers. We have to be truthful to each other as well. The truthful about what we need, what we want out of this relationship, what we feel, what God is saying to us 
right now, truthful about our struggles and inadequacies and failures. If we can't stay real with each other, what do we have? What do we actually have, right? This is actually the number one complaint about church out there in the world, right? That they're all just a bunch of judgmental fakers. So what's the point, right? That's the perception of us out there. And I hope it's not true. I pray it's not true. But I found myself there before, judging everyone, faking that I'm something I'm not, right? If we don't stay authentic, down to earth, and real, we've lost our voice and our influence out there in the world. We will never accomplish the job we've been called to do because we'll just be proving them right. We're judgmental fakers. We need the truth. Jesus didn't allow the disciples to stay up there on the mountain, sequestered in his presence all the time, right? Mountain of Transfiguration, he sent them back down. He said, you have to go back down and be with the people. And Jesus had led a life and and an example for them that was so real and every day and down to earth that when the Roman soldiers actually came to find him, they had to pay someone to tell him, tell them, who he was. He blended in. He was one of the people. He didn't look different. He wasn't wearing fancy robes and prayer garments and crazy things. He blended in. They had to pay someone to point him out. He was one of the people. He was real, down to earth and authentic, and he wouldn't have had the voice with outsiders. He had without that. We have to stay truthful. We have to get out of prolonged infancy. We have to grow up. Truth is the antidote to fear and denial. But Ephesians 4 goes on in verse 17. It says, with the Lord's authority, I say this, live no longer as the Gentiles do, for they are hopelessly confused. Their minds are full of darkness. They wander far from the life God gives because they have closed their minds and hardened their hearts against him. They have no sense of shame. They live for lustful pleasures and eagerly practice every kind of impurity. That isn't what you learned about Christ. Since you have heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from him, throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. Instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. Put on your new nature, created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. So stop telling lies. He's not talking to outsiders here. The book of Ephesians was written to the church of Ephesus. Stop telling lies. Stop telling lies, church. Let us tell our neighbors the truth, for we are all parts of the same body. I told you I like to compare versions, right? The, the living Bible, which is actually my kid's Bible that I read at home. It says, if you have really heard his voice and learned from him the truths concerning himself, this is verse 22, then throw off your old evil nature, the old you, the old you, that was a partner in your evil ways. I love how it says that because it, it makes a comparison between your evil ways and you. It says you can either partner with it or you can rebel against it. The old you was rotten through and through, full of lust and shame. There's a couple of things that the truth does for us that you can see in this passage. And number one, the truth keeps us righteous. We need the truth to keep us righteous because we like to lie to ourselves about how sinful we actually are. We like to pretend we're not all that selfish and I only do what I do because... Everybody else treats me the way that they do. I'm a victim. I'm justified in my actions and behavior. Instead of owning up to how selfish we actually are, how sinful we actually are, the truth keeps us righteous. If we constantly have to confront ourselves with the fact that we don't measure up to the full and complete standard of Christ, then we constantly have to reconcile that fact with the full and complete standard of Christ. And deception is one of those things that allows you to hide instead of doing that comparison. Deception 
hides lots of other sins, actually. I think I've told you all about this before, but I have this theory that there are really only three base sins, right? There's pride, lust, and greed. Now, there's a whole lot of other sins, but they all sort of come out of that. There's topical things that hide the underlying causes. 1 John 2.16 actually backs me up on this. It lists the, the pride of life, lust of the flesh, and lust of the eyes, something like that. Pride, lust, and greed. Okay? We can lie, for example, out of greed because we're covering up a stealing problem. Or we can lie out of uh, pride to make ourselves look better than we actually are. Or we can lie out of lust because we're covering up an affair or a pornography addiction we don't want people finding out about, right? Deception allows you to cover all of those more deep-seated issues. If you had no deception, you wouldn't be able to cover them anymore. You'd be confronted and kept accountable. And you don't want that. So you deceive. You hide. Right? We have to constantly acknowledge the fact that we don't measure up or we're never going to be able to fix it. Don't lie to yourself about it. You're messed up. We all are. Repent and be forgiven. Right? There's freedom in that. We often have to feel the pain of what we've done. I have to feel the pain that that pride is causing us. We've, we've lost friends over it. We've treated people badly. I have to feel that pain a little so that I can move past it. You have to feel it to heal it. It's actually a, a therapy tactic. Feel the pain. Sit in it for a minute. Don't try to medicate it away or, or drink it away, right? We, we do all of these things to get out of the pain, we want to get rid of it. Unless you just feel it. The only way through it is through it. <laughs> feel the pain. Allow yourself to be actually remorseful, sorrowful. The Bible talks about that a lot too. Be sorry about your sins. Feel it. Acknowledge the truth so that you can move on, so that God can heal you and bring you out of that. The truth keeps us righteous. Secondly, the truth prunes us. It prunes us. And I know this sounds pretty similar to keep, keeps us righteous, but this is more when you're already being sort of productive in the kingdom, right? Not dealing with those deep-seated things anymore. This one isn't actually um, necessarily sin stuff. God is a productive God, and he will cause you to be more productive even in the ways that you already are producing. He will prune you. Maybe it's not a sin thing necessarily, but it's just spending too much time binging on Netflix. Spending too much money on vanilla lattes. Right? Not my problem, I'm just saying other people. Uh, managing time super well. It's just little things here and there. God's saying, here's something you could be a little bit more productive in. Here's something you can grow your gifts in. Here's another place that you can serve well. Right? Truth prunes us. We actually lie to ourselves way more often than we lie to other people. Way more often. And long before we lie to other people. We convince ourselves that we're doing the right thing, that, that what I'm doing isn't actually that bad, right? We, we lie to ourselves a hundred different ways before the lie comes out of our mouth to someone else. And it starts with little things. The truth prunes us. Thirdly, the truth keeps pride at bay. Truth keeps pride at bay. Nothing comes between a church quite like pride. We start pretending, we start dying. Nothing comes between a church quite like pride. Those judgmental fakers. We start pretending, we start dying. We have to let go of pretense and be real and authentic with each other. We have, we, we convince ourselves that we're alone when we do this. When everybody else's life looks perfect and, and happy, right? We convince ourselves we must be the only one that's messed up. It, it isolates us, actually. So instead of stepping in and leaning into the church and, and using other people's authenticity and their stories and how they've overcome it, we isolate ourselves. I must be the only one, right? It, it's, 
toxic to a church culture. We have to be real with each other. That's literally what we're called to do. We share in each other's burdens. It's the job of the church. And yet we're like, I don't wanna burden other people. They're so busy, I don't wanna do this or that. It's our job. We have to be real and open and authentic with people in order to keep them comfortable enough to do the same. Craig Groeschel, a, a pastor I follow, <clears throat> always says on his podcast, people would rather follow a leader who's always real than always right. People would rather follow a leader who is always real than one who's always right. I think the same is true for friends. We'd rather have a friend who's always real than a friend who has to always be right. The truth does this. The truth keeps pride at bay. It keeps us authentic. Deception puts up walls, veils, and barriers between you and other people. It keeps people at arm's length. It keeps them pushed away, which just leads to isolation and more sin and disunity and more greed and lust and shame and guilt, right? It's a toxic cycle. Whereas if you just don't let deception in, you be real about your struggles and issues, the cycle ends. You're free. Cast off the old you. Get rid of it. Throw off your sinful nature. Another version says 20, verse 23 like this. Now your attitudes and thoughts must all be constantly changing for the better. Constantly changing your attitudes and thoughts, not just your actions, but what's going on up here must be constantly changing must be renewed. Yes, you must be a new and different person, holy and good. Clothe yourself with this new nature. Number four is the truth keeps us constantly changing. Constantly changing. I know some of us are, are stubborn and we don't like change, right? But we must be constantly changing. I overheard somebody Lately, I was out doing something. It wasn't somebody I knew, but I overheard this conversation where somebody maybe in their 40s-ish was sort of bragging about how I I'm so different from who I was in high school. And I thought, I hope so. You're at least 40, dude. I you don't start stop maturing until you're 25. Your brain literally doesn't start developing until you're 25. So if you're the same person you were in high school, wow, right? And I, honestly, and maybe this isn't true outside of, of a walk with Jesus that's true and deep, but I don't feel like I'm the same person as I was two weeks ago, much less two decades ago. I'm constantly changing. Necessarily, if I stop for even a minute, God has a problem with me. I am constantly changing. Getting comfortable in the kingdom is actually way more dangerous than you might think. It's dangerous to stay in one place for too long in the kingdom of God. Now, Proverbs 24 verses 33 and 34 is actually one of my favorite Proverbs. It says, a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come on you like a thief and scarcity like an armed man. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest. It doesn't take much. Don't get comfortable. Don't get comfortable where you are. God didn't call us to comfort zones. He pushes us out of comfort zones constantly. At least he has for me my literal entire life. I haven't been allowed to stay in a comfort zone for very long ever. My next challenge is the reward for my last challenge. And it will keep going like that probably as long as I live. God wants you to be constantly changing because that's what the truth naturally does. It keeps us constantly changing. You know, the disciples on the last night that they really had with Jesus at the Garden of Geth Gethsemane where Jesus asked them, do you remember what he asked them to do? Stay up and pray. Pray with me. And 
he went off and prayed and he came back and checked and what were they doing? Sleeping. And maybe they had a tough week, right? They walked a lot that week. They ministered to a lot of people. They probably performed miracles. And hey, I know the spiritual drain that comes with ministering to people. I get it deeply. I call it a preaching hangover and it happens every Monday morning that I preach. It's real. There is an energy output that comes with this work and you pay for it somewhere along the line. It's, and it's expensive. But Jesus asked them for one more thing. Stay up and pray with me. He didn't say go slice off ears. He didn't say stand guard because the soldiers are coming. He, he didn't say go and, and proclaim the truth in the streets. He just said pray. Stay up and pray. Don't get too comfortable there under the shade tree in the garden. Just stay up and pray. And they couldn't even do it. And maybe if they had, they would have been able to last through the next season. They all left him and said, Maybe if they had, God would have given them supernatural strength to get through that season. But they all left him instead. He asked them for one more bit of obedience. The peace that passes all understanding is this concept we often think of as Christians that maybe it's physical peace, right? If I could just get rid of all the people in my life, I'd be peaceful. If I just move to a cabin in the woods and get away, from everybody. If, if I could just have financial security, I would be obedient. If I could just get my life to this perfect place in my head, I, I could be the godly person that he wants me to be. That's not how it works. Peace that passes all understanding is not physical peace. It's seeing in the dark. It's peace through the storm, in the dark, in the battles having that still small voice inside of you, even when it, the world is raging around you that says, you're going to be okay. You're going to make it through this and you're going to be stronger on the other side. You have to be constantly changing, constantly confronting yourself with that truth to attain that peace. Don't stay in the same spot and don't get too comfortable. I don't want to be someone that hides. I did that for a long time. I'm not doing it anymore. I posted a photo on my Instagram and Facebook story this week of a very messy kitchen. And it was my day off, and I had worked 14 hours the day before and 12 and a half hours the day before that, and I was beat, and I was still working <laughs> on my day off. In between crises and celebrations and just loving people, it, it, my kitchen was messy. And I was sitting at my kitchen table preparing this while doing a bunch of other things and I just felt like people only see the upfront this the put together word the nice neat little packages but it doesn't come like that and I don't I don't want to be somebody that hides that I feel like I'm I'm pretty honest with you guys up here I'm sharing my struggles and my faults with you I'm just asking you to do the same. Be real with each other. Share your struggles with each other. If we don't come together and be authentic with each other, we will never make it into our purpose as a church. We're not going to get there. We're not going to get there. People can often feel when you're being disingenuous. They can't maybe put their finger on what you're lying about, but they can feel it. You get into an argument with somebody and you're apologizing left and right. You're saying all the right things, but with the wrong spirit, they can tell. They'll often just say, I forgive you just so we can have this conversation be over, right? They'll walk away from it, although they're not quite on the same page. We need to connect on a deeper level, authentic with each other, not just saying the right things, but being the right things. Just use every opportunity to hold yourself to Christ's standard, to see how you measure up and then to acknowledge that you don't and accept God's grace anyway. I heard my favorite quote, maybe of all times, definitely one of my favorite 
quotes to remember and, and really quote to myself lately at a women's conference by Susie Larson. And she was saying that when she was young in ministry, she asked somebody older and wiser than her for some advice. And what the woman said back to her has changed her life because she said, you'll be given a thousand opportunities to die. To die to yourself, to die to your sinful nature, to hang that thing on the cross with Jesus. You'll be given a thousand opportunities to die. Take every one of them. Take every one of them. Nail that selfish nature to the cross and walk away free. Get rid of it. The truth keeps us constantly changing. This is not a once and done thing. That, that darkness that I went through a couple of weeks ago, I felt like I came out on the other side resurrected. God put me up on the cross that week and he resurrected me a new person, new wine, fresh anointing and vision from him. And it was worth it going through that crushing period to get to the other side. And I could see in the dark beautiful and amazing. The truth does this for us, keeps us real, keeps us righteous. It, it prunes us. It keeps us constantly changing. But here's the balance of this, because I don't want us walking out of here beating people up with the truth. We could easily do that, right? We, we justify a hurtful comment by just saying, well, I'm just being honest. Right? But that's not what this passage is calling us to do. It actually says, speak the truth in love. And that's the bit some of us like to miss. There's only two ways to speak the truth. With love or without it. With love or without it. Are you going into this confrontation, this um, argument with somebody to win them back, as it says in Matthew 18? Or are you going in it just to hurt them, to get that jab in there. What you're saying might be true, but if said in the wrong spirit, it can still be wrong. Don't get caught walking in the truth, but not in love. It's a dangerous place to be. We can all use Jesus's words, but not have his heart and still be wrong. Religious people do it all the time, don't they? They use his words as a weapon. He didn't intend them to be that way, except to very religious people who are doing exactly what they're doing, <laughs> right? He didn't intend for them to be that way. And Jesus will actually cast you out of heaven saying, I never knew you if you're that kind of person. It's a dangerous place to be. Don't get caught walking in the truth, but not in love. And on the other hand, we also have to be able to receive the truth in love. Chris Hodges, one of the pastors that I follow, he's said before, you know, about once a year or so, he takes his wife out on a very nice date. He prepares this moment where they can be alone and have an, an honest conversation. And he looks at her in the eyes and he says, how am I doing as a husband? How am I doing? Or what can I do better as a husband for you? How am I doing? And I've tried this, y'all. <laughs> It takes incredible vulnerability to actually ask this question honestly and prepare yourself to not be defensive when the answer comes. The person you know best in the world, the person that knows you best in the world, the person that has to live with you every single day, right? And to actually get past the, oh, everything's great, whatever, it's fine, right? Don't just let that be the answer. You're not perfect, come on. Dig a little bit deeper. No, really, what can I do better as a spouse for you? And <laughs> the problem is you probably know what they're going to say. You're just, uh, you've been unwilling to change it, right? <laughs> been excusing it away for a while. It takes incredible humility to actually hear that answer and not respond defensively. That's what we're called to, though. We have to also receive the truth in love understanding that it comes from an authentic place, or even if it doesn't, right? Sometimes people will jab you with something, but it really only hurts because there was a little bit of truth in there. <laughs> might've hurt a little bit, but they might've been right too, right? 
we can take the truth, we can use it to change ourselves, to be a better spouse, friend, church member, mentor, leader, right? can use that truth to make us better. We have to get this. I was preparing this this week. There was this urgency in my soul. We have to get this because we've got souls to save. We have a job to do. We have to get this. We have to be real and authentic with each other. Deception doesn't work anyway. The truth will find you out, the Bible says. The truth will find you out, but the time it finds, by the time it finds you out, it will have destroyed you in the process. That thing you're keeping secret, the thing you're lying to people about, you don't want anyone to know, it's destroying you. Maybe it hasn't gone so far that everybody knows, but it will. Confess it. Use the church as it's meant to be used, right? You have to go to God for forgiveness, but you go to his people for healing. Confess your sins one to another, and he will heal you. Confess it. Use the church as it's meant to be used. We're meant to be real and honest and kind to each other. Where we, a place where we can confess our faults, get prayer, and walk out healed, not more beat up. We only do that through authenticity honest, open, real conversations. It cannot possibly worth be worse than the secrecy and death you're currently living in or headed toward. An honest conversation is not that bad. The most empowering thing actually is doing the thing you're so scared of doing. It's never as scary as it seems. And now you have a small victory under your belt for the next one and the next one after that. We've got souls to save. We have to stop hiding. Stop lying to ourselves and each other. Stop making excuses because we've got a job to do on planet Earth. We've got souls to save. Father, we thank you and we praise you for this word. Thank you for using your word to teach us and correct us and guide us into all truth. We're open to hearing it today. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would just convict hearts and minds today. That you would unearth and unravel the, the lies that we spin, the deception that covers so many other things. That you would just speak to hearts and minds today. And I'm talking conviction, not guilt. Guilt does not come from the Holy Spirit. Guilt pushes you further from God. It makes you want to hide from him and run the opposite direction. God, don't pour guilt on us today, but conviction, beautiful conviction that comes from the Holy Spirit that shows us the love of our Father, exposes the ways that we're putting things in between us and him and calls us back to him so lovingly. Thank you for being a God that does that that wants to enter into our messes and help us clean them up. He doesn't ask us for perfection out of the gate. He comes in like he came down from heaven into our imperfect world and helps us clean it up from within. Holy Spirit, do that with us today. Show us ways that we can be better, ways that we can improve, ways that we can walk in unity with each other. Father, today I pray for every single person that has never received that freedom before, that doesn't have a relationship with Jesus currently. Father, bring your love and your hope and your peace to each and every one of us struggling with that, but also the knowledge that we cannot do this on our own, that we've messed up, that we're trying too hard to do it on our own and we need to just give it up and give it to Jesus. Today with heads bowed and eyes still closed, if you would say, that's me, I've never given my life to Jesus before, but I know I can't do it on my own. I know I'm messed up. I'm scared all the time. I'm stuck in my selfishness and my sin and I just want to be free. Jesus can do that for you today. 
In just a moment, I'm just gonna ask you to shoot your hand up in the air if this is you. If you wanna be free from selfishness, if you want a brand new start, if you want a relationship with the creator of heaven and earth, Jesus is the only way. He's already paid the price. He's already done the hard work. All you have to do is believe that he has. He gives it to you so freely. So if that's you today and you want to say, I want to give my life to Jesus. I want to ask him for forgiveness and start living for him for the first time, the first time in a long time. Would you just raise your hand right where you are? Only me and the ushers can see. Anybody like that here today? I want to give my life to Jesus. I don't want to move on before you've had this opportunity. I want to give my life to Jesus. Okay. Maybe you've been walking with Jesus for a while. But today you're saying, I've been hiding. Maybe it's some big secret sin thing, but maybe it's really simple. It's just, I haven't been confiding in in people like I should. I haven't been sharing my struggles and my burdens with them. But I want to stop hiding, pretending that everything's okay. If that's you, would you raise your hand? I want to stop hiding. Thank you. You can put those down. Last, maybe you don't struggle with the honesty part of this. You don't have a problem being real about your issues or other people's issues, but you do have a problem with saying the truth in love. And it's the love part you need to work on. You need to ask God for a heart for people. Ask him to help you love them better. If that's you, and I want to love people better, would you raise your hand? Father, thank you for every single hand raised this morning. Thank you that we get your word deep down in our souls, that it changes us and teaches us and corrects us from the inside out. Father, I pray for a deep unity to wash over this church, that we would be deeply honest with each other, truly authentic with each other, that we'd be able to love each other in unprecedented ways, that your purpose would bind us together that we would be single-minded in our pursuit of seeing souls saved because we know what Jesus has done for us and we want to see so many more experience that love as well. Thank you for making us a vibrant, passionate, selfless church who wants to change the world with the message of the gospel. Father, I pray that you would send us so many more souls, that we'd be able to see the people in our life as souls to save in desperate need of love, freedom, and hope that can only come from you. Father, we thank you. We praise you. In Jesus' name.